Uh, good morning, and I'm uh, honored to be among you this uh, morning. I come from a very troubled region. Uh, <clears throat> many ask what's happening in the Arab world. And uh, what's happening in the Arab world, we're not pioneering. I want to draw your attention to the little history and take you back to March 15th, 1848, when Chancellor Metternich had to flee his palace in Vienna after three weeks of peaceful demonstrations. He fled in a cart and horses. More than 150 years later, Ben Ali of Tunisia had to flee in a jet and Mubarak and chopper. And it took Europe 90 years for the dust to settle down. It took the French to get the nephew of Napoleon to run for elections. It took the Germans the Bismarck, Berlin Conference. Award one, award two, and yet today even it's being discussed whether Britain, the men in the EU or not, and the base of Greeks hold the concept of marrying the Libya girl in Europa, but born there. Uh, Arabs are democratizing. It's going to be painful, bloody, long. My expectations, three to four decades. And the one question we should all ask ourselves whether in Washington, Buenos Aires, Palestine, Israel, Africa, Asia, what do we do to make the right people win? Right people, I mean democracy, human rights, women's rights, the rule of law. The question of my lecture today is the most relevant to answer the question of what do we do to make the right people win. Because since my prophet, God bless him, Muhammad died, we had had 803 movements in political Islam. I researched them. 803 is Daesh, ISIS. 802 Nusra, 801 Khorasan, 800 Qaeda, and then I can take you down to Karam Turbots, who took the black stone from Mecca and was in Bahrain for 33 years. Islam is a great religion, like Christianity and like Judaism. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism should not be a threat to anyone. The minute we go to synagogues, mosques, and churches to use God and not to worship God, we can have bloodshed. God created us and God will protect us. And the minute some of us claim that God needs protection, so they take God's word, which is the most corrupt, vicious way of thinking in the use of Islam, in the use of Christianity, and the use of Judaism. <coughs> but ideas are not killed with bullets. I researched humans throughout their development and involvement, and I found out that ideas are never killed with arrows, swords, or bullets. We are killed, but when his body is after the government. Ideas are dealt with with better ideas. What do you expect? Saddam Hussein, being a good dictator for the West, when he goes to a crazy war against Iran for eight years. And then he ventures to the right way, and to Washington and Europe, he becomes a bad dictator. Gaddafi, his mother Teresa, when he opened his country for investments, 
and then they help. Asad, what do we do? We destroy the institutions of state, the dependence in the one person, and then one morning, one evening, one afternoon, this person disappears. And what happens in the country? It goes towards chaos. And people, as the natural feelings, they seek protection. They find it in their tribes, and they're being Shia, Sunni, Muslims, Maronites, Christians, South, North, and the employment of all these elements. What Arabs are going through is democracy, and what we need to fight that with is better ideas. We need good governance, the rule of law, women's rights, human rights. And anyone who says Arabs are not ready for democracy is a racist. The second thing that's needed to defeat extremism and their ideas is peace between Palestinians and Israelis. And here, we don't need to reinvent the wheel or eat the apple from the stock. The question that I'm asked to answer, whether the two-state solution is still viable. Sir, the Minister, there is only one option. It's a two-state solution. I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that Christian and Muslim Palestinians will not convert to Judaism and become Israelis. Jews will not convert to Christianity and Islam and become Palestinian. And I know, since Eve negotiated Adam, I'm the most disadvantaged negotiator in the history of man and woman. I have no army, no navy, no air force, no economy. My, my people are fragmented. And if it's my word against any Israeli in the Congress and the Senate, I don't stand a chance. I'm dead. And I don't say that life is about fairness and justice. On the other hand, Israel is a country with 4,000 tanks, 2,000 fighting planes, and nuclear weapons. But having said all of this, they have three options. They don't have four. Option number one is my option. To live and let live. Two states on the 1967 line. And as Palestinians, we have recognized the state of Israel right to exist on the 1967 line. That's 78% of historic mandate in Palestine. And accepted to form and establish our independent state on the remaining 22% of the land, i.e. West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. And in my opinion, this is the only option. Because some of my own people criticize me and ask me to shut up about the two-state solution and they recommend a one-state solution. There is no such a thing as a one-state solution. A solution requires the agreement of two parties. Israel will never be part of a solution to a democratic, secular state where Jews, Muslims, and Christians will be equal with one person, one vote. Because the reality today between my constituency, Jericho, and the Jordan River, and the Mediterranean, it's 83 kilometers, and this will not change. Those who live in non-Jewish households in this territory, from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean, are the majority in the land in August 13, 2000. <laughs> so if Israel doesn't want two states, and they cannot be part to a one-state solution, Democracy, democracy, what they're doing on the ground is one state, two systems. So Netanyahu, as much as we put a strategy, he was also designing his own strategy of one state, two systems. Ladies and gentlemen, today in 2015, there are roads in the West Bank and East Jerusalem we cannot use as Christians and Muslims. The Israeli Knesset is discussing to pass laws called sterilized roads and sterilized buses. And such diseases as bigotry and racism, once they inflict our, underneath our skins as humans, we have made the mistakes to justify, whether we are Arabs, Muslims, Christian, white, blacks, Jews, whatever. 
Sometimes we offer sociological explanations, sometimes psychological, sometimes economic, sometimes sexual, and today Israel is offering a security explanation. The fact we go today in the West Bank with as Palestinians with green ID cards. Israelis have blue. My license plates for my car is white and green. There is yellow. Ignoring facts don't mean they don't exist. If you sit in front of me, sir, and you say you don't see me, you have a problem. You have a problem, not me. Ignoring facts don't mean they don't exist. And political blindness, which continued this occupation for the last 48 years, have led to a system of corruption. Ethical corruption. Today, there are Jewish kids who come from upper middle class families, maybe from your country, from Washington, from Paris, and they believe if they come to the West Bank and Jerusalem and harm Palestinians, they're closer to God. I don't think you want them to be your neighbors when they come back to Buenos Aires. Or to Washington. Or to Tel Aviv for that matter. It's time for a wake-up call. I could care less if someone is pro-Israel or someone is pro-Palestine. Because my real world is divided between those who are pro-peace and those who are against peace. That is the truth. That is the truth. <coughs> and preserving the two-state solution requires a lot of will, and a lot of goodwill, and a lot of understanding for the interests of interactions in, in our region. I did not wake up one morning and feel my conscience aching for the suffering of Israelis I sit with them, honestly. And they did not wake up one morning and feel their conscience aching for my suffering that they sit with me. We both do realize that our conflict cannot be solved in accordance with a zero sum game. Cannot. Losers we have been through conflict, and winners and a win-win situation can only be provided in the two-state solution. So this is why, to those nations who say we want a two-state solution, we tell them in Washington, in Berlin, in London, in Paris, in Madrid, do what Argentina did, recognize the two states, not one state. If you say you accept two states, you stand tall and recognize two states and not one state. Because the other state is trying to undermine the other state by settlements, by dictations, by fait complete policies, by using every deck in the book to undermine Palestinian state institution building, and so on. Today, we have done a few things as Palestinians to maintain the two-state solution. Our choices are very limited. <coughs> there are those Palestinians who tell Palestinians, don't listen to Mahmoud Abbas, don't listen to Saad al Only violence can work. Because we have been unable to deliver and if you don't deliver to your people, you cannot afford to give your children what they need in schools, they seek another father. <coughs> and uh, what we're arguing, and I don't know if we succeed or fail, with Palestinians, please don't despair. Stay the course with us. We're going to do it. We're going to bring Palestine back to the map through international law, through Security Council, General Assembly, the Geneva Conventions, and of course, the ICC, International Criminal Court. But don't use violence, that's our message. Because relationships, whether it's between individuals, or between groups, between neighbors, or between nations, are based on one key word, F-A-I-R. If your wife is not fair to you, you're not going to have a marriage. 
if your employer is not fair to you, you're not going to be important. If your neighbor, the nation state, is not fair, you're going to have problems. And you don't solve your problems with wars that you build on the other people's territories. You solve it with good fences, as the Americans say. It's a very critical juncture. When I say our region needs democracy, because I don't think any Arab leader can compete with Mr. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is a self-proclaimed caliph of the Islamic State, ISIS. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is offering the desperate Arab and employed youth, 70 virgins, and a castle. Telling them kill Saab al die and come to heaven you provide with us. I have 24% unemployment rate in the West Bank. I cannot even promise a one bedroom apartment and a job for anyone. I cannot. So if you see Dash walking in the streets of Jericho or Ramallah, don't be surprised. So they said, Ideas are not killed with bullets or security measures. This damn occupation must end. And the world must stand tall to stop treating the Israeli occupiers as a government above the laws of man. This is the source of evil in our region. No one is against Israel's right to exist. Please study the Arab peace mission that was introduced by His Majesty, the late King of Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah bin Abdullah. The Arab Peace Initiative, which was adopted in the Beirut Arab Conference, Arab Summit Conference in 2002, is a Saudi initiative, Saudi Arabian initiative, that said very clearly, if Israel withdraws from the Arab occupied territory in 67, all Arabs will normalize the nation with Israel. What more do they want? The choice is theirs, settlement or peace. They can't have both. Two parallels that, that will not meet. And now, we have witnessed the emergence of a deal between Iran and the five, or the six. It's a good deal. Our region doesn't need more wars. We don't need more wars. Our region is much better with the agreement than before the agreement. Iran is not going to disappear. Political geography is political geography. It will not change. But to Netanyahu, how do I export fear to my Israeli public? If Obama takes away the threat from Iran being a nuclear power, and if Mahmoud Abbas takes away the threat against Israel by recognizing Israel, how do I export fear to my people? That's why he stands against the Iran deal, against the peace process, against the Arab peace initiative, against anything. Because to people like me, he wants to tie my hands and tie my legs and throw me to the sea and kill you. Look, he's not swimming, he's not a partner, but he's drowning, he's not good for me. About your obligations, your commitments, the agreement signed, your commitment to the two-state solution, that's, that becomes relevant. So today, as I said, we changed. Palestine, in 2012, became an observer member of the United Nations, which gave us the right to be members of 523 conventions, protocols, and institutes. We became a high contracting partner in the four Geneva Conventions last year. We became part of the Hague Conventions. And this year we became members of the International Criminal Court, which is bothering Israel. And to those bothered in Israel, and those who support Israel, if you don't like courts, stop committing crimes. It's as simple as that. If you don't like to go to court, stop committing crimes. If you don't commit crimes, no one can take you to court. But that age and dates where Israel will do things 
and get away with it is over. We are not seeking revenge by going to the ICC. We're a small people. Simply, we cannot afford 12,000 killed and wounded every two years. We're seeking international law. We're seeking your support to make sure that such attacks against our civilians will not reoccur. And that's not too much to ask. That's not too much to ask. When the level of deterioration, ethical deterioration, reaches the point where two months ago, the Israeli Justice, Justice Minister, Madam Sheikh, will stand on Israel TV <coughs> and refer to Palestinian children as little snakes, people get surprised when Israeli settler burn a Palestinian daughter to death with his mother, his father, and his three-year-old brother. It's the culture of hate, and the culture of discrimination, and the culture of bigotry and racism. And who's responsible for this? It did not, people were not born evil. Those who are responsible for such crimes are those who institutionalize settlements, subsidize settlements, and fight the two-state solution, and fight the peace process. It is the Israeli government that we hold fully responsible for such crimes. And then we're asking the UN to study the possibilities of providing a special protection for the Palestinians <coughs> under the Israeli government. We feel not secure. We don't feel security. And we don't have the means to defend ourselves. We don't. And we need international protection. And we have filed to the International Criminal Court three files, one concerning settlements, an ongoing crime since 1967, one concerning the 2014 attack in Gaza, and thirdly on the, the prisoners. I hope that the international community will stand shoulder to shoulder with us in showing Palestinians that they're not alone and that legal international means internationalizing the issue <coughs> will work. We're threatened today by the American Congress to proceed with the ICC that they will cut our aid totally. That's, they have choices. They have choices to make. But then, if you're going to continue this path of taking Saddam Hussein as a good dictator, and then kill him, Gaddafi a good dictator and then kill him, Assad a good partner and have to partner and then kill him, and then treat Israel as a country above the poor laws of man, don't be shocked. And you don't need to research it in your universities. Why Daesh and ISIS and Nusra and Qasem? are being flourishing. There are consequences to such policies that we must stand tall to, to face together. And it's not confined to me, the threat. Today the world is small. And threats don't have borders. They don't stop borders to present passports. You've seen the members of the Ash. They were not, majority of them were not born in the poverty stricken refugee camp of Talata, Hasni of Wahid, or the refugee camps of Akbar Jabba, Bosnia. For God's sakes, they all were born in European capitals, middle class or upper middle class. So we need to, to preserve the two-state solution. And for urging the Americans, the Russians, the UN, and the Europeans to expand the quarter, we really believe that the model that handled the Iran, Iranian question was a good model, was good for China to participate, Germany, France, and others. And we believe it's good for the BRICS, China, India, South Africa, Brazil, also Argentina, countries like Japan, they should take part. All those who believe in the two-state solution must help us. And no one will come to replace the Americans. No. We want to complement <coughs> the 
Americans are trying to be fair to this question. So the only solution is a two-state solution. But if Mr. Netanyahu wants to refer to Jerusalem in the Hebrew term Yerushalayim, and to my hometown Jericho in the Hebrew term Yericho, and refer to me as Mar Erekat, which means Mr. Hebrew, we as Palestinians have never been racist. Judaism to us is not a threat. Judaism to us is one of God's great religion. Our conflict is not a religious one. It's a political one. And I don't see a difference between a thug, murderer, criminal who puts a Western journalist on his knees in an orange suit and slits his throat and between a criminal thug who burns Ali Dawarsha an 18 months old alive simply because he's a Palestinian. I don't see a difference between those who claim to be the heads of the Islamic State or those who claim to be the heads of the Jewish State. Let's leave religion out of it. It's a political conflict. The God of the Jews and the God of the Christian and the God of the Muslims is not about revenge and killing. That's the truth. So leaders should stop exporting fear and taking the role of God. And we should stand tall. And as Arabs, we did not really face this phenomenon the way we should. We have thousands of universities, thousands of university professors. How many books, how many articles we stood up to face such criminals and thugs and ISIS and so on? Very few. Very few. <coughs> it's a sad moment for all Arabs to know that we did not gather our resolve as professors, as intellectuals, as writers, as journalists, to face such criminal thugs who use our religion, in the name of our religion, which is so alien uh, to Internally speaking, in order to achieve the two-state solution, we need to do things as Palestinians also. We need to continue building an institution of the state, accountability, transparency, the rule of law, believe me, Palestinians will never see with the eyes of Muhammad Abbas speak through his tongues and listen through his ears. They have their own eyes, their own senses. We have 26 political parties and one of them is called Hamas. And we're offering Hamas today the following. We're telling them when we differ and we differ. We don't resort to bullets, we resort to ballots. We need to go to elections. That's number one. And number two, we need a national unity government to begin immediately the reconstruction of Gaza, where eight persons live in a square meter in the most poverty stricken region on the earth. And action must be taken immediately. And unless we don't tell ourselves as Palestinians, no one, no, nobody else will. It's up to us. We are talking to Hamas, urging Hamas to accept these two principles, elections, and in a national government to reconstruct Gaza, and uh, I hope they will accept. I hope they will accept, because I don't, I don't see honestly why we fight each other. Because uh, some people declare <coughs> Gaza is liberated in 1948. There was a justice, a, minister, a, a judge called Justice in the International uh, Court, International Justice Court. He was asked a question in our legal uh, training. <coughs> if an occupying power withdraws from an occupied territory, and after the completion of the withdrawal, it verbally threatened to, to reoccupy that province. Would you consider this province to be liberated or under occupation? His ruling was under occupation. So imagine Gaza under siege. 1.7 million people in the biggest prison on earth. Eight persons to a square meter, to a square to each square meter, depleted in water resources. And what we need to do is to form our national unity government, because I don't see the possibility of a Palestinian state without Gaza 
and I don't see the possibility of a Palestinian state in there. So the Palestinian state, territorial dimension, is the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. And I hope, as I said, we will uh, do this as soon uh, as, as we can without undermining the fact that we have 26 uh, political parties that have the full right to take part in the political partnership in the future of Palestine. Can I assure you today that Palestine will one day be back to the geographic map? It will not be another number, nation state 195. We know what Palestine is all about. We know what Palestine means to Christians, Muslims, and Jews. We know our task is to build the institution of accountability, transparency, women's rights, human rights, the rule of law, and we're going to be the bridge for civilization. Palestine will be an added asset for all, not a threat to anyone, including you. I hope my message is a message of interests, a message that shows people that political blindness and extremism will not offer any solution for the future. Fairness will, justice will, and as I said, we are seeking no revenge from anyone. It's not good for our society to seek revenge or to get angry or to be bigoted. We have every right. We have every right to be angry, but it's not going to serve us. No one stands to gain more from peace than Palestinians, and no one stands to lose more in the absence of peace more than Palestinians. And peace for us is to live at this level. It's for the state of Palestine to live side by side, the state of Israel, under the 1967 lines.